uh, the rawness and just the, the fact that it's unfiltered and delivered with such honesty um, is one of the things that's so powerful about it. Well, you know, uh, it just it just happened. I didn't plan this. Uh, I didn't um, sit down with some sort of honesty scale. <laughs> it just it's. I tell you what it is. I, it, that, that's exactly how this these lectures came about. Uh, in that sense, I directed over sixty plays in the theater. Mm -hmm. I've had 60 casts of actors in front of me and plays, comedies and dramas by very fine writers. And when working as a director with a cast of actors, you're seeking the truth. Mm -hmm. And you can't have any bullshit. We can't have bad acting. We can't have we can't, whatever. And, and so the, the, the tone that you take with actors, which is one hand, you know, firm, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, Show me what you can do. Give me anything you got. Encouraging improvisation, right. and so you know whatever. Exploring, you know, you know what the Germans call rehearsal. Nah. They don't call it rehearsal. Rehearsal means rehear to do it again. Mm -hmm. In German, it's proben. It's to probe. Hmm. It's to investigate. Okay. And so when I'm directing a play, we're investigating this material, and there's a seriousness and a and a and an openness but the pursuit of truth right so it isn't it isn't by chance that when i got up to lecture i just treated my my right. my students as if they were a cast of actors <laughs> and we're doing henry gibson here and and uh, it could be really bad if we don't get it right <laughs> <laughs> and so it's the same i that's 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 the attitude yeah. of my lectures and so um uh, as uh, again, I, it, it, it's not as if you can plan these things. You know, I just it just one thing fell in place, and I got up, and it turns out I could do right. it. Because if I was a bad lecturer, the Sherwood Oaks Experimental College, where I gave the first lecture, wouldn't have asked me back mm -hmm. the second time. And <clears throat> okay, that and so I mean, it, you know, it's it's it, obviously there was a quality. Um, in right. the original, that as I said, I just, I just did what was natural to me. And, and I'm, I'm curious. You mentioned that you're growing, you're, you're now growing, and I, and I want to circle back to Storylog and talk a little more about mm -hmm. that. But you mentioned you're also, you've grown it into, into genre-specific presentations, and, and there were a couple of other things. The, the, I come from a world of entrepreneurship primarily, and, and I'm much newer to the world of, of writing. Um, but I also I come from, from the world of being a longtime marketer and, and copywriter because I've written my own copy for years for my own companies and for other people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned very, very early is that there's a huge overlap between your ability to tell story in almost a form of like a, a therapeutic metaphor, which allows somebody to place themselves in, in the message, you know, sort of the sales message and see an outcome that they can then adopt as their own and then relate that to whatever it is that you're selling from a business standpoint. It, it seems that there would be a, a huge n need or a huge use, u usefulness in teaching business people, especially marketers, how to become really effective storytellers. Is, is that anything that you have any interest in exploring? Oh, I've done it. Uh, no. The Harvard Business Review no. interviewed me and I talked at length about the use of story in business. And I, had, I do private consultancies mm, okay. uh, for law firms and corporations and uh, government agencies and you know all kinds of um, organizations um, who feel that their story is not being told well and um, uh, I gave the keynote address to the incoming business administration graduate um, uh, uh, students at the University of Michigan mm -hmm. uh, some time ago and we you know, it's the same subject. And the subject for business is persuasion. Right. Okay? And uh, there's three ways, basically. You can persuade somebody. You can do it with rhetoric. Fact, fact, this authority, that statistic, right. fact, but th th therefore, and you should believe this because I just proved it. That's one way. The other way, or the second way, is um, through story. Well, you take those facts and you dramatize them into a story mm -hmm. and you involve them as if in this story. Right. And then they come out believing uh, and because the story has emotionally persuaded them. Right. The third way is coercion. <laughs> yeah. You can bully people, you right. can seduce them, you can bribe them, 
<clears throat> you can play with their heads of, in various ways. Um, but the trouble with coercion is that it is successful only in the short term. Mm. And then they'll come around and kick you in the ass if you miss, you know, yeah. misuse people like that in business. The trouble with rhetoric is that the person you're trying to persuade has their own statistics and their own authorities mm. and their own facts. And while you're trying to persuade them, they're arguing against you, right? right? Also, they know from their, their experience that when you use rhetoric, you are concealing all the negative evidence, mm -hmm. okay? You're only arguing from those points that would support your argument. Right, of course. When you use story, you get the best of both word, worlds. You remove them emotionally by the storytelling and their identification uh, with the protagonist of the story. Even the protagonist is the little company that could, right? If that's the um, protagonist. Right. And so they, they get moved emotionally, but not in a rude way, like in, in when you're using right, you know, exactly. coercion. And the facts all get across, but in story, you have to admit the negative in order to then move dynamically to the positive. And so the story has to go like, we created this great product, but then somebody else stole our idea, so we had to go back and reinvent the product and get the patent ahead of them. And then the, the FDA wouldn't give us approval, and so we got past that and we did this. And so there's this dynamic, right? right? And, and somebody that listening to that feels, that's real, because I'm in business and I know there's as much negative as there ever is positive. Mm -hmm. And so when you tell a story dynamically like that, it, it, it becomes very persuasive. Yeah, I can So I have, I have taught those little lessons uh, um, in many places. Yeah, and and I, I would love to see more of that in, from you or you know, whoever is, it else may be capable, although clearly nobody is as capable. But, um, because there's, there's such, a, you know, the times where I've woven that into my own marketing experiences, it's so powerful. Yeah. And and it's like what how you explain this uh, you know the story lies between the the difference between expectation and result when you bounce back and forth like that in a story or you progress the story even from a marketing standpoint it's it's a little bit of the, of, of the equivalent of overcoming objections and acknowledging that there yeah. are issues and then but moving the story forward by addressing it and then moving through it and then sort of spanning the gap and getting somebody to that place you want them to go. It's, and it's, it's powerful in business. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to me to hear you sort of explain it in, in the way that you perceive it in the business world. Well, there's nothing so powerful as the truth. Yeah, completely. And right. when people feel that they're being lied to or they're being bullied or they're being seduced or they're being brought, whatever, um, when, 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 and people have an antenna for these things. And so uh, if, even if the coercion is done with the flattery, they still know it's bullshit. Yeah. And when the, when, when, the, when the rhetoric is full of um, slanted facts, they still know it's bullshit. I mean, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and so, but I tell you, it isn't as easy as, it may, as you make it sound because uh, one of the reasons we still have PowerPoint presentations in the business world, mm -hmm. why they still want to use and rely on rhetoric is because uh, they don't want to admit the truth. And if you tell a story, you have to admit that at times my company screws up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, nobody wants to say that in front of the stock uh, stockholders, right? But if you can tell a story, you have to admit the negative. Nobody has the guts, very few people, only great leaders have the guts to say, you know, <clears throat> we went in the wrong track. Right. I took us in the wrong track, but now we're going right. back. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, and the other is talent. I mean, it's just, there's just no getting around it. Some people can tell stories, some think people think in, in story, yeah. right? Some people think in facts, and they have no gifts for taking facts and, and weaving them into a story. I mean, and so you, you can teach the form and the techniques of story to business people, but they have to have, they have, to have the gift for, and, 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 and that's something that shows up when you're a little kid. Mm -hmm. There are little kids who can tell stories and then there are little right. kids that bore the hell out of you. And so, um, uh, but I can make a good storyteller better. Mm -hmm. Now that I can do. Just give me somebody with talent and I, they pitch me their story and I can give it a critique and, and show them how 
if they'd have done this and this and that. So I can improve a good storyteller, but I don't think you can make a storyteller out of somebody but, who's... Which is, which is fascinating, because there, you know, Malcolm Gladwell came out with Outliers, I don't know, four or five years ago. And right around that time, I had actually been reading the research that he cited in the book, which essentially said that there's a, there's a huge backlash against the notion of talent. And there was a similar book called, I think it was Talent is Overrated, that came out around the same time. Yes. And the argument was that actually there's no such thing as talent. Yes. It's actually what these researchers are calling, interestingly enough, the ten, the, the, either the 10,000 hour or 10, 10 year rule that it takes 10,000 hours of what they term deliberate practice, meaning you don't just show up and hit a bucket of balls. You show up and every ball you place there, you say this is going 238 yards out and it's going to land here. And with every shot you try and correct. And that That's through nice. that, it it's, overcomes talents. It, it sounds like you don't it's buy nonsense. that. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. I have played golf since I was 12 years old. <laughs> I taught my son, Paul, to play golf when he was 12 years uh. old, okay? <clears throat> And um, I'm I, uh, not anymore, but I've been a single digit handicap most of my life, okay? Uh, Paul has talent. <laughs> I, when he was 12 and I put a club in his hand, I mean, he has got just tr beautiful eye hand coordination. He has a feel for these things and he's scratch, <laughs> okay? And he's the, the, you know, the son of my loins, all right? <laughs> you know, and I know his mother didn't give him that talent. And he got talent from some <laughs> mysterious place. And he practices no more than I do or whatever. Right. But he's got the gift. Hmm. I mean, he hits a ball like a, like he pinches it off the ground. I, I never could. Hmm. He's got talent. And um, uh, now, given talent, um, then you have to put in 10,000 hours and 10 years and all the rest of that. Right. You know, because talent is not uncommon. It is, I mean, talent is not, sorry, talent is not common. It is uncommon. And, but, there's billions of people on this planet. Therefore, there's hundreds of millions of people with talent. Therefore, all of those people are striving, the talented one against right. the other. Um, and so the one who works harder uh, is going to, you know, make it against the, the lazy but talented person. But the notion that talent is irrelevant yeah, it's it's fascinating, and 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 there are these two blockbuster books coming out that essentially argue. Well, just you know, it's that. very yeah. Well, that's it, you, you know, know I, I I could make a blockbuster <laughs> out of that book too, because basically you're saying to people without talent, it doesn't matter. And right. So the untalented people are going to buy the book and say yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, it doesn't matter, right? And so it's you know it's it's a kiss assy <laughs> thing that complements the the right. the untalented, and and by the way, I don't know why. Anybody who is talented should feel complimented because they didn't have anything to do with their talent. Mm. I mean, they, it's like their IQ, they, they were born with it. it. The talent, as we talk about in class, is the ability to discover the hidden connection between two things that already exist and put, a, put them together to create a third new thing. Okay, Everybody can do this.